Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. Uh, we're going to have a fascinating conversation today. Uh, if you are into artwork and healing and holistic approaches to things and kind of setting up a, a zen environment, uh, then you're going to want to pay attention today. Uh, my guest today is a ball of energy. She is an expert in Ikebana. I hope I didn't mispronounce that. She will definitely let me know if I did. Uh, but art therapy, living through that creative lifestyle, things like that, and how that can help manage stress, improve your life, things like that. So uh, if that's something of interest to you, you definitely want to pay attention. Before we get into it, make sure that you like and subscribe and follow the, the channel and my guest as well. Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Nefertiti, welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast. Good afternoon from Little Cambridge, Massachusetts. So thrilled to be here, at least in the virtual space with you. Thanks for the invitation. And I get to be passionate about my craft and share it with your audience. And it's a beautiful thing. I'm beyond delighted to end the year strong as a guest at the podcast that you are so graciously hosting. And you know, I have been following your work and some of your guests and I have nothing but praise. It's full of valuable content. Whether you are a veteran or you are a supporter, it's very good content that it brings a lot of value and substance to many aspects of life. So I'm cheering you up all the way around and delivering, you know, as much information from what I do and with the idea that it's going to be of use and service to some people the same way that it had been for me. Awesome. I appreciate the kind words. And, uh, you know, I'm always excited to bring somebody on to talk about things that I know very, very little about. I mean, I may have been stationed <laughs> in Japan. I may understand, like, the idea of, like, Zen environments and feng shui and other things. Like, I, I, I kind of get it, but I don't know it all that deeply. Um, and we, like we had had a long conversation a few weeks ago and I told you I wasn't creative and I realized I, I am kind of creative in my own little ways. I'm not creative with like drawings, you know, and, and folding things, you know, if you want a stick figure, I can do that really good for you. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that might be about the limit of my artistic ability in that realm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I knew from the moment that we were connected in York and Castaneda, uh, a past guest of mine a couple of times, uh, and a good friend of mine, she she recommended you. And when we first started talking, I was like, wow, okay, that's really interesting. You know, Zen environments and and, and you know, tying in mental health and, and just living a better life and all that through art therapy and some other things. I'm like, fascinated, love it. So it was a slam dunk. And I, I meant it in the intro when I said you were a ball of energy. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I know well. you're going you're gonna to educate us on, on some of these things today, which is awesome. And I am already feeling accomplished because that's my mission. I'm very passionate about educating, but also not just the tactical part of the academic part. I am more into let's put into function and application. So you make it a lifestyle. That's what it's important to me because you can be learning things all day long and every day of the week, but if you don't apply those pieces of information into something that is going to be suitable for your lifestyle, then it's a waste. And my approach is very dynamic, organic, and very intentional. Like, for example, I recently taught a class at a local library, and I know that for the most part, some people will present on their very structured fashion, and they do cookie cutter, the same class repeats over and over again. I showed up overloaded with material, things for show and tell, and I went around the table. I had 15 people attending because it was bad weather, so I feel accomplished. 15 people under inclement weather, that was a total success. And I asked each one of them, what are you looking for? What is your idea of success? And I crafted a class on the spot in front of them based what it was going to be of service to each one of the attendees. So that's the way that I like to present myself. And that's the way to make better connection. Because when you show interest on the receiving person of your knowledge, then they can feel that sense of bonding. And then you are paying attention to their needs. It's not about the frame of 
being a guru from a stage. I don't do well with that. I like the interactive, the connection, and the epic memories because that's how you build those fun times that you're going to treasure later on. So right here, right now, these are the good old days and let's get that rolling, right? Absolutely. So tell us a little bit more about yourself, some of your background and, and what you do and things like that. I will start by saying I am based in Boston. I have lived in 10 different states within the country. I have lived in South America, the Caribbean, Polynesia, in the United States. So my cultural background is very diversified and very eclectic, and that makes me a very unique individual. How I look at life, and how I present my craft to the world. And because I have moved so many different times, I pick things from different cultures and then I apply it into my daily life. So it becomes a lifestyle. I have this passion for cultural diversity because I think that it makes the world a better place to embrace the opposite. You know, let's be happy with the similarities that you have but also embrace the diversity and the difference because that's what's going to enrich the connection and the relationship. So you get to be experimental and explore things that otherwise you will not be exposing yourself to. So that's kind of the cultural aspect of it. Then from the professional side, I have been very dedicated to teaching and performing since 2007 started as a way for me to keep my mental sanity and just do some community work. Then I realized that there's a lot of people out there making money in something that they are not even all that skilled. And I decided to take it upon myself to do those educational programs. Because like, for example, I signed up for the class and that was back in 2007 when I was in South Florida. The woman who taught the class, she's supposed to be an educator and she has all these degrees and fanfare and she left a lot to be desired as an individual and as a teacher as well. So I look at those experiences and I said, well, I need to be the change that I want to see in the world. So I'm very passionate about teaching because that breaks ignorance and that is a very important topic for me. And then I connect that to a holistic way how to carry your life for mental health and inner peace because people talk about money and success and businesses, but reality is that unless you are happy with yourself from within, unless you have inner peace, there's no true success. The success, it can be from the outside but then when you are by yourself with nobody around to give you the lip service, then you know that you are empty inside and then you sink into depression. Then you engage into substance abuse. And if you put the two and two close to each other, then you are going to realize that if you are truly happy and peace with yourself, there's no room for self-sabotage or substance abuse or mental issues. But nobody talks about that approach. And again, here I am making the noise in the world and bringing the changes that I want to see. Wow, we can almost wrap right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. there's a lot to unpack there. I, one of the, you know, the cultural thing, as you were saying that, I'm one of those people where I, I just don't understand why there's so much hate in this world for people of other cultures, religions, etc. I feel like you learn so much more about yourself when you learn more about other people in other cultures. It allows you to reflect a little bit more of who you are and what you may or may not have in your culture. And it just, it just brings people together, right? When you, when you are just naturally curious and really want to know and engage with other cultures, you really learn more about them. You learn a tremendous amount about yourself. That's, that's a win, 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 win. <laughs> you know, well, I, mean, I have to tell you a very personal story and whew, this is first time that I'm making this public and this is a, a recent realization that I had that sometimes you have the cultural issue in your household and nobody has a grip on it 
And the reason why I'm saying this is that people engage into relationships and there's an underlay of hatred that it comes to surface when they procreate. I am the product of that. I am a wanted child. On my father's side, there were Portuguese, French, and Scandinavian from the time that the Scandinavians migrated to Normandy in France and they got converted from Vikings into Christianity. So then on my biological mother's side, they are gypsies from mainland in Spain and a whole bunch of mix up there, Japanese, Middle Eastern, Polynesian, and people from the Canary Island. So as time progressed, I was the recipient from both of my parents of certain passive aggressive behavior that I couldn't quite understand until I got into neuroscience. So on my father's eye, I will be no good enough like a gypsy. I couldn't do anything right in his eyes. Then on my biological mother's side, in her mind, I was just as cheap as the Portuguese people that came fleeing from the war. And I was a recipient of these two different layers of viewing on each other's culture and I'm half of each one. Did you see the hot mess that I grew yeah, up oh, in? No, absolutely, yeah. That, that makes perfect sense. Never thought about it like that. That's very eye-opening. So when I take it upon myself to be cultural, diversified, and inclusive, it's because growing up, I didn't have the sexy environment that a lot of people think about. Oh, you have all those far away land, you know, jeans, and it's so sexy and so kind of iconic. Well, that sounds that way, but in reality it's not because I was never accepted here or here. So I am in purgatory. And that's part of the conversation that we had a few weeks ago behind the scenes. So that's one of the reasons why I'm like, okay, I need to fix myself. And dealing with family was not the key. Going into substance abuse was not the key. Getting hooked to pharmaceutical products was not the key. And much less getting experimental with drugs was not the answer for me either. So I went on a personal quest to see what it's out there that is going to become the solution to my troubles. And I found it. And that floral therapy, neuroscience, Japanese philosophy and humanistic Buddhism. So I'm very passionate about it because I see it all the time, all the struggles and the things that people are not talking about because they are not even aware that exists. I have been a guest in a multiple number of podcasts in the past few months. And what I have to say to the world, I am not joking and I'm not bragging. It's my drop every time that I say my point of view to a podcast host. They're like, whoa. I didn't see it coming. I never thought about that way. Nobody say anything like that before. So I'm being very unapologetical about it. And I just took the very deep breath and said, okay, here we come. What the people see out in the world in current time, this is my version of me. And I'm going to vent out the dirty laundry because there's no other way how to fix your emotional issue. If you don't make to peace to those issues, you are never going to be successful. You are never going to find inner peace. So you have to come to that moment where you dissect all the chain of events and say, okay, this is what got me here. And this is how I detach myself from those bitter experiences. And this is how I can bring value to the world. And after the whole virus apocalypse, I just noticed even more pronounced that we are all sinking into some sort of mental issue, some sort of emotional challenge, but nobody talks about because we're too good for that. Or the stigma that if you ask for help or if you confess that you are depressed, then there's something wrong with you. Mm -mm. Let me tell you, I spent most of my years depressed, chronically depressed. And it was nothing to do with me. It was all environmental. My parents 
my family, being on Wankel Child, coming from a culture that is very macho, center and colonial mentality, I can write books about it. There's nothing wrong with me. So now that I clear out the landscape and I can plant the seeds that make me happy, everything in my life is blooming, everything. So love it. now you can carry <laughs> on with the conversation. No, I, I love that. I think you're not alone in this either. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that have that middle ground perspective you know, that maybe they need to sit back and realize that they've got something, whatever, whatever it is, maybe it's religion, race, culture, whatever, pulling at them at opposite ends, that they have a unique opportunity to sit there and look at things from the middle ground and see those kind of things. And one thing I hope, I wish for everybody is they could just figure out who they are and be unapologetically themselves. There's a journey though, to get to that point. Oh, it's very painful I know, I'm too. not there. You know, I mean, like I'm I'm working on it, but I do love the uh, just just putting it out there and you know the boldness and all that stuff. I, I love it. I I think some people need to hear the hard the hard to hear things, and you know you can look at it beyond that too. Like anything that's divided, where you kind of pull in one direction or another. You know, you just you see different things from different perspectives. I don't. I don't get into politics in here. Um, politically, I'm very middle of the road. Let's put it that way. And I see things on both sides that I'm like, I like this, but I don't like this. Like, this is ridiculous both ways. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's just a lot of ridiculousness. But, you know, it, it's it's an interesting place to be where you get a little bit more perspective. Where if you're on one side, you, you don't get the other people's perspectives. But you don't get... Um, you don't get the education and learn about things and unless you talk to other people of other cultures and other experiences, which is the beauty of things too. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, one of the first things I wanted to talk to you about was kind of along those lines of, of creating a Zen environment. So what is Zen and what, what is creating a Zen environment in your life look like? And I'm assuming you're not taking this from like a, a physical inside the room space. No, it's a uh, composite of different layers because Zen starts from you, within you, and then outside. But at the same time, it's a very fine dance. It's a delicate dance because they are connected and intertwined. And because they are so intertwined, it can get very challenging to clear out the clutter and to get center and many times you come to that situation of being a chicken or egg type of scenario like which way do i go and of course it's not a cookie cutter or a, a cooking book recipe type of thing and it's a very personal journey so in my case i had a level of success until the virus apocalypse hit. But I had a lot of issues that I kept in the basement, in the attic, underneath the bed, in the closet. I was busy, I was rocking my style, and I was being fabulous. But the moment that the rock got pulled from under me, that I cannot perform, I cannot be social, I cannot go to the bar, I cannot do performances, then I am forced to be within four walls. And that's when the depression got even more chronic and deeper. I was having insomnia every night. I was stressed out, depressed. I was mm -hmm. randomly having this mild pain, uh, pain um, anxiety attacks. And it was just awful until one morning like around 3 a.m i say enough of this i don't know how i don't know when i don't know what's the answer yet but i need to become the solution to my own troubles and i went on a quest so by filtering and curating the environment out of pure necessity i start finding out more about myself neuroscience was a very key component because I have to do the inner work 
but it was facilitated in a very scientific way that I can do it myself. I don't have to rely on a therapist. I don't have to rely on a shrink because that codependency, it was just terrifying to me. I didn't want to go that way. I have trust issues for a number of reasons and I rather keep self-contained and within my resources. This is not for everybody because there's time that yes, it's legit, you need medication. I am not a doctor and that's not my call, but I'm talking from my personal experience, how things went down and what evolved out of it. So zen environment, it's having the adequate space for you to allocate time for contemplative moments and curate what's coming, what kind of information, how do you carry yourself out to the world? Because again, it's a very delicate dance. It's just like tango, you know, one move that way, the other one follow. It's very interesting. You say so, I'm not much of a dancer. <laughs> I believe well, you on no, that. <laughs> yet, you are not aware of it, but yeah. after a conversation, you know, you can think about it and you're going to be like, yeah, I am not only creative, but I'm dancing too. Ooh. And I just realized I don't it. know. Talk to my wife. She'll tell you I'm not a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started by cleaning things that I noticed that it will trigger my mind. So you have to start with awareness. That's the key part. Sometimes you are like agitated and you don't know why. Well, look around, pay attention to what do you notice and what it's out there getting you bent out of shape. So that could be anything in your environment, like your dresser's cluttered or there's dishes in the sink, or you don't like the, the color of the paint on the walls. And you're like, you know, I gosh, I really hated that blue bluish gray for a long time and I need to paint it, you know, I'd feel, I just feel a little bit better inside by doing it. Th that kind yes. of thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good way to start. And also be mindful about what makes you happy. When I started this whole neuroscience endeavor, the guy who was training me and we still connected, I am not going anywhere. I mean, he has to die for me to just like drop the program because it had been so important to me and my well-being and one of the things that he say and i was like "Ooh, how do i do that i it just didn't quite register but it was this beautiful phrase do more of what you love less of what you tolerate and none of what you hate i've heard that before so the moment that you start applying that into your life, even if it's just one little thing, okay, what makes me happy? Gardening, allocate the time for gardening. What makes me happy? Well, go for some vanity, allocate the time for that. What makes me happy? Dancing, okay, make it happen. Don't leave it out there floating in the ether that I would like, but I can't because you are depriving yourself from pleasures in life that it's going to trickle down into mental issues. And again, nobody talks about that. Anything that you are suppressing, repressing, and not being proactive in communicating that you are just sucking it up, that's going to evolve into some serious mental health issues. I think that's where we find problems, specifically with this podcast being about the military and veteran community. We have this problem of being kind of the military mindset, that macho mindset of like, we are strong. You know, we, I'm strong and uh, the guys and the gals to my left and the right are strong. We're, we're, we're strong. We're supposed to be, you know, carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders and not showing any signs of weakness. And by going to mental health or discussing these things or thinking about it, it's, it's perceived as weakness. It's a taboo. Nobody wants to take the uncomfortable conversation. I get it. And that's the reason why I'm taking it upon myself because nobody else is doing it. Okay. Me being the performer. Okay. I am not that shy being out in the public. So I'm going to make my noise in the world and I'm going to shake a few trees. And earlier this year, I got requested to be part of a few books. 
And that really shaked me from the inside out. And once you put something on writing and you vent out your dirty laundry, it's a little bit of uncomfortable decision to make. But once you make it, it's so relieving because you are making peace with yourself and you feel like you are getting justice being delivered. Because there are certain situations that they are not going to get fixed. The person who did the wrongdoing upon you is not going to ever even acknowledge that he did those things to you. And then you are eating your heart out. Oh, you know, this person is just treating me like a crazy individual. Well, that's their business. Just make your own peace with yourself and what is going to make you a better person at whatever capacity that is. So I started doing community work. I got more involved into neuroscience art as therapy getting out there my point of view and now my craft is taking off it's getting international recognition i have the books with my name associated to it and again everything is blooming but if i didn't take the uncomfortable action taking of okay i'm gonna put myself up there and i'm going to dig into all the pain there's nothing sexy about that i cry a lot i cry the amazon river and the nile river in the process but it was totally worth it and it, i'm it's like here ripping to... a band-aid off it's been on for a long time it's gonna sting <laughs> right exactly. it's gonna sting for a while i mean i've been through this myself with some of my issues like you know i had blinders on for years that i had any problems or issues and everything was just fine and peachy in the world but you know, then I, you know, I, I hit a certain point where I had that, that moment where I decided to do something and nobody else is going to do it for you. You have to have that mental awareness and recognition that you have to do it. It's like, it's like trying to quit smoking, right? You can go cold turkey or you can wear the patch or they probably have a pill. I don't know. Right. But it's on you to actually not pick up a cigarette and light it up. Right. Right. Like, you either do it yourself or you get a little bit of assistance. The, the, the patch would be the same thing as a mental health provider. They can help you walk through it, help you make sense of things, help guide you through it. But the work is on you. you yeah. You're the one that has to work through it all. Well, you just said the work, the work is on you. And that's also one of the issues that I see here in America. Because in a country with so many resources and technology, everything has to be instant satisfaction nobody wants to do the work so it's easier to go to the therapist and think that you're good but you're not it's easier to get into the substance abuse or the pill because everybody or the majority of them wants instant gratification instant resolution and it just doesn't work out that way you could, you could study anybody who's been successful at whatever. Could be business, could be life, could be come to overcome substance abuse, whatever. They'd all tell you the same thing. It was hard work for a very long period of time, and they had to focus a lot of energy on overcoming that or, or pushing through and not just giving in. There's no magic pill. There's no, hey, take your red. You see it on Facebook every now and then, right? Like, would you have the red pill that does this or the blue pill that does that? <laughs> Right. Can I get but a jello? Like, right. No, I know. Is there is there a mix there somewhere? You know, there's no e there's no easy button for all that stuff. You just you just got to work through it. As painful as it is, or as however long it's going to take, you got to do it. You got to put in the work. Yes, but also it's all in the way that you frame things, because when you say, "Oh, it's hard work." You're already making it hard on yourself. From the neuroscience perspective, your brain is absorbing everything in words that comes in as information, whether it is real or not. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very adamant about curating my environment, what I listen to, and even the way people talk when I'm around. And I have been avoiding certain people because I hear the negativity coming and the intensity that it's coming. And I'm like, I don't want my brain to absorb that. I'm good. I don't have a TV. I don't pay for cable. I run away from politics. I curate the kind of music that I hear in the radio stations. 
And if I hear, for example, like some of those rap songs that everything is screw the world and the world owns me and, you know, I'm oppressed, like, no, I'm good. I am not listening to that because the more you allow those words to be floating in your brain, the more sinks in and the more you own it. So I keep myself in a bubble, totally in a bubble. Everything is art, everything is blooming, everything is beautiful. And I made a declaration earlier this year and I got invited to be part of one book and my content for the book was, I no longer settle for average. That was my thing. My approach is either wicked awesome, blooming, or it's a masterpiece. Those are the three options for me to reply to something. When, Very interesting. Reframe the narrative. Yes. Right. So when I hear people say, no, it's not too bad, not too shabby, same old, same old. And I'm like, ooh, no, you got to go. I don't need that kind of replies. That's not the way that I carry on with my life. So that's just few of the mental hacks that it have been total success for me. I see the difference. And also I have been contemplating life lately. One thing that I do at the end of the year is that I look back to that particular calendar and I do an inventory of all the successes, the accomplishments, the things that make me happy. And then I rehearse all those at the end of the year. And it might sound like magic or coincidence or weird, but there have been a good number of things in my life that it started as a joke or just like an idea crazy out there floating in the ether and have become a very tangible reality in my world. So I am very careful with the words now that I pick, even how I joke about it or how I allow people to address it. And if you allow somebody to, you know, call you names under the banner that we're joking, I have a lot to say about that. It's passive aggressive. Passive aggressive is a form of abuse. You are sabotaging your own success because by you not setting the tone, you are accepting that in your subconscious and you own it. So people need to stop the madness. And when I go to, for example, an event and I might meet somebody and perhaps because I am happily single, there's a hint that it could be a potential date. I'm like scanning out, okay, how many drama it's involved. Do what are those red flags, the hairs on the back of the neck, like something's off here. Uh, yeah, so I am paying attention to all those things because the moment that you welcome somebody in your life, you are going to get a splash with that energy. Whether it's success, drama, passive aggressive behavior, inconsistency, uh, you name it, that's going to be a splash on you. So I'm very particular when it comes to the people in my environment, not only the quality of the people, but also the environment itself. Like my place, it's a little messy now because I have a busy season, but I have art, I have flowers, I have things that I look at it and it makes me smile. It is intentional because I already know how to program my brain to smile, to be happy, to be appreciative of those things. So those are more additional tricks and hacks how to improve your mental health and your inner peace and happiness. That's some, that's some awesome stuff. And we co we talked about a little bit of this a few weeks ago when we talked, and I think I may have mentioned it then. There's a there's a real estate coach that I that I follow. If anybody in real estate that knows what I'm talking about, his name's Tom Ferry. He wrote a book many years ago called Life by Design or Live Your Life by Design, something like that. I'll be honest, I didn't read all the way through it. I read enough into it for it to have an impact on me to be like, you know what? There are certain things that you can do that you have control over and certain things you have zero control over. I think part of being a veteran kind of helped that in some ways. Like like you mentioned news. I'm the same way. I don't watch the news. 
I don't care what the 10 people on there's opinions are about whatever's happening in the world. What I want is facts. That's all. I will read, I'll pull up a news website once a day just to get a general idea. And all I do is usually read just the headlines. What's going on? That's all I want to know. What What is the basics of what's going on in this world? I don't want everybody else's commentary and opinions on it. I'll form my own because they're my <laughs> opinions, right? <laughs> you know, but like different, you know, just, just one example of one thing that I've done that's very in line with what, what you're saying. You know, I definitely have some few things in my office that would help with the Zen environment in here. But, <laughs> but there's there's a lot that people can do to kind of to kind of set that. Whether that's, and there's no top dollars involved. You can do it at very low cost, if any. Sometimes just by tweaking certain things and arranging in a certain fashion, and you are good to go. There's no need to have these mindset that oh i don't have the money for it or that's too expensive or i don't have the time they are just little things increments of improvement that you can do over time that your future self is going to thank you later yeah, and I, that you should be considered i mean i can sit here and, and honestly a bit one of my issues for myself that just kind of bugs me is i have paper notes for everything i i jot stuff down or else i won't remember it but it, Occasionally, I need to go in and put them into the computer somehow so that I have them long term and I don't need these little scribble hand notes, right? Because it bothers me to have all this paper on the desk that I never flip through. It's not, you can't, it's not searchable. It, it bugs me, right? Because it's on my desk. That's one of those things that, like, for me personally, that I have to work through. Like, get this stuff off of here and be more f clean and clear and clutter free, right? Because I see it every day and I'm like, okay, I really should, you know, kind of dive into that right <laughs> start start working towards fixing it up a little bit so like it, it could be little things like you said like it could be transcribing notes online or a couple of bucks for a can of paint and paint a wall rearranging some furniture change the layout i mean there's a lot of things i think you could do if you if somebody sits and reflects on it and says what would be better around here you know i know my wife would say probably if the kids would actually do the dishes you know that would be nice that would help everybody <laughs> There's, there's something, I guess, is my point for everybody and every everybody's living situation that they can improve. Right. Well, there are a few kind of hacks and tricks that you can do. For example, you mentioned the notes all over the place. We box you, but they're there and they're not going away. Maybe allocate just five minutes, 10 minutes. And you look at the pile and you say, okay, every day, because this is very important. In neuroscience, it's not about the intensity, it's about the consistency. So you don't have to go full blast in one day to fix it all. <coughs> because, uh, do you do, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Do you do editing? Can uh, we pause well, for a well, second? Yeah, go ahead. Just go ahead and mute yourself. Okay. Go ahead, let her take care of that. There. there you go. So yeah, there's a lot of things that people can do. I'll just continue on with this and just, just some ideas that I'll toss out as a brainstorm um, that, are, that are relatively small. And I, I, hope, I hope she can hear me and, uh, and give her two points on this here in a second. But you know, one thing that you could probably do for your environment is just examine where where you're at on a regular basis. You know, if you want to think about in terms of your physical environment, um, where do you spend all of your time, right? Hopefully you're spending eight hours a day sleeping in your bedroom, but your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, your bathrooms, you know, maybe your home office, maybe your office, wherever you work, right? And just start breaking those down, stand in the middle of the room and look around and say, what needs to change in here? How can I change this up? Uh, what am I going to do to like um, take this to the next level and make these changes that I need to make? Um, it could be just about anything that you could do in those those kind of environments. So just sit in the middle of the room and look around and say, what, what can I change? I don't know if you heard that or not. Yes, yes. Okay. I was any, definitely any, th too. any thoughts on that by taking it you know, room by room or environment by environment when it comes to the physical stuff? Yes. It even that, it's a little bit ambitious. 
you should go by a corner because everybody's too busy. So you just pick a shelf or pick a, a little section because otherwise it's not gonna get done. Your brain is gonna be like, oh my God, that's too much work. It hurts, I don't want to think, I gotta flee. So you have to, and that again, that's the reason what I say, the consistency, not the intensity. So, so you take like 10 minutes every day and say, I'm gonna start with this room. And no matter how many days it takes you, you start with this corner, this shelf, this thing, whatever, maybe the floor, maybe clean out what's under your bed, whatever. And then when you're done and you sit there a week later and say, wow, every day this week I attack something in this room and it's now all done. And you yes. move on to the next one. And there are a few things to be added in that department. Number one, by the consistency, your brain is going to get trained. So then it doesn't have to think about it. And it takes at least a hundred days for a behavioral pattern to be established. Otherwise, you're going to have the inner dialogue of your brain resistant to it. Because one of the things about our anatomy is that it's going to run on conservation of energy. So if I have to think too much, you want to avoid that. But if you start a little bit, little bit, little bit, then your brain is like, okay, here we go. The little bit again, I don't want to think about it. So it becomes a behavioral pattern for the positive. So you look at the mess and you say, okay, I'm going to concentrate on magazines and clear out all the magazines. Or I'm going to go from the top of the pile, few papers, whatever I can clear out within seven minutes or five minutes. Because the moment that you pass the 15 minutes mark, then you are like, ah, that's too much. I don't have the time for that. So you have to be your own trickster of your own mind when you're starting new endeavors. That's very important. Well, that's brilliant because, I mean, everybody can squeeze 15 minutes into their schedule somewhere. I mean, I would imagine almost everybody could squeeze 15 minutes of their day consistently to do something. And also, the other thing is the ethical bribing. That's key. And don't go for, oh, I'm going to have cookies. No, 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 you don't want to go that way. Ethical bribing in the sense of, for example, uh, there's, a, let's say, a concert that you want to go at the end of the week. And that's going to be your reward for the five, seven minutes that you are doing every day. And then you are going to give yourself a reward for staying on track. So you get that extra burst of dopamine, like, yeah, I'm accomplished. You know, I did the five minutes every day of the week and I'm going to treat myself to go to that concert. Or I'm going to take myself to uh, drive along the shoreline. Whatever is the little perk that is going to do it for you, that is going to make you happy. So the consistency on a small increment, that's very important. I make it a regular practice and the reward, but no getting to, oh, I'm gonna have a bottle of wine or, you know, I'm gonna get the box of cookies because then you are creating a very negative behavior that you are going to regret later. So you have to be, again, very mindful about how you play those tricks with your brain. Awesome. So anybody going through this, you know, they're setting behaviors, they're doing positive things, trying to get their environment. But stress is one of those things that just comes up. It just happens. So if somebody's finding themselves stressed, um, what has worked for you to, to, to just kind of slap yourself and be like, hey, wake up, I'm stressed. I need to lower the stress level and get back to, you know, optimum performance. And you oh, I have, so, on that. <laughs> I have to say so much about the stress because I was chronically stressed for a while. So you have to start by a stress. It's the knowledge of you are out of capacity. So you have to step back and look around, be mindful and be aware. At what level or what is making you feel that you are out of capacity? 
Is it time related? Is it relationship that is stressing you out? Is it the boss? Is it the traffic? What is it? And then the things that you can do to mitigate that. One very important for me is to have a way of self-expression. And I call it my holy grail. The holy grail is again that mix of neuroscience with Ikebana, which is the equal of floral therapy. If I need to process something, I go to Ikebana. If I need to be creative, I go to Ikebana. If I need to contemplate and make important decisions, I'm going to give myself that center of you know, gravity for a moment, pause, contemplate before I jump into it. So the way of self-expression is very important. Also, what makes you happy? Because it's not a cookie cutter. And quick tricks that you can do that you're gonna see like the results immediately. One is breathing. So you breathe in and I usually do count of three or five going in. Then I pause for like a count of three or five, depending on like how much of a rush I am. And then exhale out very slowly in a count of about seven. So when I do the breathe in, you say I'm breathing calmness or I'm breathing certainty. And you pick the word that it's gonna do it for you. So at some point I was, okay, I'm breathing in calmness I am excelling chaos because I was feeling in total chaos. So that was the, the choice of words. And you don't have to do that too, too long. You don't have to go on a, con on a conquering quest of, oh, I'm gonna be a Sang meditation master. No, you just do that minute and a half, two minutes. So the breathing is very important because you can only pay attention to one thing so when you do the breathing, it doesn't matter the stress, it doesn't matter how crappy you feel, it doesn't matter anything, you are counting. Your brain cannot concentrate on anything else but that count of breathing. That right there automatically is going to interrupt the pattern of you being stressed out or being fuming because something happened. Then the other thing that you can do, it has, uh, is to have something handy that it's going to trigger your mind to pleasant memories. And it can be, you know, a necklace or something that you look at the wall or something that you might be hiding on the drawer. So you just go for that trigger in your mind that is going to reset you the other thing and this is going to sound kind of funky but just shake like just shake it and if you see like the dogs and the cats when they like randomly shake like crazy that's the nervous system kind of resetting any the same applies for humans so by the fact that you just like shake it off again interrupts the partner it's very easy to do you can do it in the bathroom you can do it you know behind the door before you go into an office uh you don't need to be a master on the topic and you don't have to spend a lot of time or money those are like super quick way that you can do it on the fly i like the shaking one i mean because i mean, I mean you can do it anything i you know, say you're sitting at your desk and you're just you're tired of looking at what you're looking at, right? You know, you need, you need stressing you out, you're frustrated, whatever. Just get up and move. Just, you know, stretch your arms, do some stretches. Like you said, shake it out. Like, do some pacing back and forth. Kind of work up the heart rate. Snap your attention off what it, whoop, here you go, banging my microphone all over the place. But, you know, <laughs> just, just that movement to snap you out of whatever that is. Like, I'll do that in my office. If I get really tired of working on a task, I'll just be like, all right, put it on pause. And I will, I'll go to my family room and I'll walk around a little bit or I'll go do some laundry or go upstairs, talk to my wife for a little bit. And we both work out of the home, but you know, just that, that break. So, it, you know, you're just kind of re-snapping, you know, you're not also, going down that, that, that path. 
yeah also a couple other things that you can add to the mix to your repertoire of uh, tricks and hacks you can just step out to the fresh air look up to the sky just for a few seconds and just that movement of looking up and a smile is going to reset you it just does wonders and then the other thing is to have a space where you can just like sit and relax for a few moments and it doesn't have to be extended period of time having a floating arrangement is very beneficial because you have the water and your mind immediately goes to the tranquility of having a shallow uh, water surface because that has to uh, do with the biophilic art and that's something that we as human are connected to nature and sometimes we do ourselves a lot of harm with all these technology and being in the speed of light, internet connection and multitasking, you are overloading your brain. So you just have to let it go for a few seconds, look at body of water, uh, light some incense and just allow that to kind of take over the environment and reset. Because we have this wrong image that, oh, you have to try harder and you have to go longer and you have to do a marathon and you have to prove and you have to multitask. I have no idea how they came about, but it's totally wrong because the more you overdo yourself, the less productive you're going to be. It's proven. Oh yeah, absolutely. I thought, you know, on the outside thing, you were just going to mention just going outside. I mean, I know you're on the East coast. I'm here in the Midwest. You know, in the summer you go outside, you can get hit with the heat wave and humidity. <laughs> in the winter, you can go outside and just freeze your butt off for 30 seconds. And that'll snap you right back into a different mindset, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to make you feel quite alive. Yeah, hey, both of them will. That's for, that's for sure. So y you mentioned, uh, I told you I was going to mess up. Ikebana? Ikebana. Okay, Ikebana. So that's a floral flower arrangement. So explain a little bit of what that is and, and what that art form is. Ikebana is the soothing and contemplative art of floral design created in Japan. It came originally from China and it was mostly practiced at the beginning of the art form as a devotional art. So it was practiced by the high priest in the shrines and temples, and it was to decorate the space where Buddha statues were displayed. And from that evolved into more the elite and the imperial family. It was a very exclusive art. Then it kind of went down a little bit in the different classes and became part of the samurai lifestyle because it's a contemplative art. So when you are not out for battle, how do you keep your mind sharp for the decision making and having your intuition on point and having creativity for a strategic planning on point? Ikebana is a good tool for that. Now, in current times, it's a little bit misconcept in the sense of some people might think of it as a superfluous art of oh, flowers, that's vanity or something of luxury or necessary, but it's a good sustainable way how to keep your sane environment, have a way of self-expression and also how to be in tune with the nature. And it's very sustainable. It's not all that luxurious, like some people have the wrong image of it. I can do Ikebana anywhere, anywhere, anytime with branches and an unwanted, you know, unused glassware from the kitchen. So you don't have to go into thousands of dollars paying for that expensive program like I have done. You can do it out of nothing. It's very eco-friendly. You can recycle, you can up, upgrade, you can 
uh, repurpose. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it. And one of the things that it has been getting me sort of international attention is that some people talk about, for example, rescuing pets. Well, everybody has a different passion. I go and rescue dead flowers. And with the dead flower, I do sculpture. And it's something that not too many people are doing. And because I intertwine the neuroscience with the Japanese philosophy and the humanistic Buddhism, it makes it more unique. So I'm very passionate about sharing that with other people. And again, it's something that you can do at any time, anywhere with zero resources. I have done pieces just water, glass, it can be dollar store, it can be from the kitchen, one of those mixing bowls, and a dandelion floating. And a lot of people hate dandelions and they are look at it like, oh, those unwanted weeds. But you can do tea with those too, and it's very medicinal too. So it's just a how you can see the positive and the possibilities to use different things within a given context. I think that's what I like about it is it's 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 art and there's tons of different art you can do out there, right? It doesn't have to be this. You could focus on music or art or something else. The beauty is an eye of whoever's looking at it. You could create something beautiful or you could just create something either way. The real power is in your presence while doing it and what it does for you when you're you know, in the right mindset and you're, you're thinking, you're contemplating whether that's what your next move in life is or just cutting something out of your mind and just focusing. I mean, there's so many different benefits. I think that's what's really powerful. And it, as somebody like I jokingly say, I'm not artistic. Uh, I really am very interested in art as a therapy. Like I really, I, I'm very, very interested in it. I, I, I mean, because you could do anything. You could do Ikebana. You could do... You could do pottery you could paint you could sculpt things out of metal and weld it together you could find scrap wood and build something out of it it doesn't matter you can take old articles of clothes and repurpose them i mean there's all kinds of things go to an art museum and you'll see exactly what i'm talking about right i mean it's oh. just all, all kinds of stuff well you mentioned that you're going to be coming to boston to visit i have to take you i never have visited yet <coughs> oh, excuse me oh my god Allergies at this time of the year kills me. <laughs> oh. <coughs> there is such a thing called the Museum of Bad Art. I of haven't been art? there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that ought to be interesting. So I might save the visit for when you come over and we go together. So you're telling me I could start creating some really bad art and get famous for it? You see, nothing is off the yeah. table. That's my chant. I, I appreciate that. Any, especially anybody else out there, don't steal my idea. <laughs> <laughs> don't take money out of my pocket. <laughs> I, I got bad art to create. <laughs> hey, hey, That's really know, cool, though. That's got to be very interesting. Oh, that has to be hilarious. I know that it's a thing, but I have never visited it. And actually, it's not too far from my neighborhood either. The funny thing is, what, what makes bad art? Uh, we have to assess that. Because when I go to, I, I mean, I've. I was not into art at all until I was in college a few years ago. I took an art history class, started thinking about it a little bit more. And like I said, I mean, I jokingly say that I'm not artistic. But when I look at the uh, famous paintings and sculpt sculpt uh, sculptures, I'm like, wow, the time, the energy, the focus that it took to make those, the technique for the different brush stroke techniques or, or the dot type paintings, you know, I really appreciate the skill that it took for those artists to create those paintings. And so I, I've, I've changed my philosophy on artwork because I, a couple of years ago, I would have been like, who cares about art? Like, I honestly would have. But taking that class made me appreciate it a lot more and appreciate the skill that it took. And mm -hmm. I think what's interesting now is I see that, okay, not only it takes skill, but it has all these other positive attributes to it. Yeah. Which, which is awesome. Just imagine, think about how much... Uh, how much time some of the famous famous artists of, of yesteryear uh, had on their hands, you know, painting the Sistine Chapel and other famous works in Italy. 
they had a lot of time yeah. probably by themselves to think. <laughs> well, and not only that, but if you look, for example, at Gothic architecture, the Sagrada Familia in Spain is still under construction, and it has been over a hundred years, and it's still at it. So to create masterpieces, yes, they're a lifetime process. That goes back to that consistency, right? You know, Dedication. wake up every day and and work at it a little bit more. I'm gonna steal some. I'm gonna steal some words from a late friend of mine. When you wake up every day and you ask yourself, "What am I gonna do today?" You just get up and do it. Uh, a late friend of mine, you said all the time, and it's it's just like that. Just wake up today. What am I gonna do today? Go do it and be consistent. Like that's all there is to it. Rome wasn't yes. built in a day, right? <laughs> Quite no, literally. it was not. Neither the world. And imagine that, you know, it takes seven days for the creator to get it done. So what is left for us? Take your time. Exactly. Don't rush it. It's not going to be instant satisfaction. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, back to the Kevana, I have to put it out there because you mentioned, and I know for a fact, too, guys in law enforcement and the military they can be you know very like macho tough i don't wear colors and i don't do sissy things and screw the world you know pure power few things it's scientifically proven that it's not conducive and you are not going to get done stuff out of pure willpower 24 7. you're going to burn yourself out that's one the other one is that Ikebana, it's an art that it has been practiced for centuries by military strategists. And to kind of confirm that, in current times, one of my favorite Ikebanese practitioners, it's a guy retired from the army from Norway. And he is so talented. He repurposed things. He come up with his own containers for the flower design from like air filters and scrap metal. It's just such a delight to see his creativity working. So this is not just like, oh, superfluous CC, girly things, flowers. Oh, that's not up to my standard. It should be considered because it makes you more in tune and you can find a lot of unhidden a lot of hidden talents that you didn't know that you even had because you start recycling looking at possibilities looking at ways how to address you know like issues of design usage of resources and it really makes you a better person because how you do one thing is that how you do everything else and there's no limits or restrictions and that's something that i love and on the program from the school that i am attending there are a, more than a hundred prompts for you to do a design which means that there's no place on cover in your environment like for example use dry materials fresh materials only branches only flowers only uh, for example, the color of the container is going to be the, the focus point. The view from above, the view from below. So by you putting yourself in that moment that, okay, what can I work that is going to match this space? Or how can I use the current resources without me having to spend money? to cover that space or to entertain somebody or to enhance the table for dinner tonight so it brings your level of awareness and your capacity to think fast in a very unique perspective that it gives you a very strong advantage comparison with the rest of the world i can really see how that would have a, a, a crossover impact if you will into other parts of your life, right? We're, we're, unfortunately, as a society around the world, for the most part, we're a throw it away, buy new, 
kind of system, if you will. Yeah. You know, all the stuff that goes into the landfills, all these different things that you could create art out of or things that you maybe throw away at your house, uh, maybe something like that. You could say, you know, maybe I don't need to throw that container out. I can do something else with it. Maybe it's not artwork, but, oh, this could be a storage container for this or a storage container for that or I could repurpose this for this or there's useful parts out of, you know, five different things I could throw away four and condense all the working parts into one, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we've gotten to that point where that resourcefulness is kind of gone in our society. You know, I've, I've been in a lot of homes of people who are that generation, the greatest generation, the World War II era generation who grew up in the Great Depression. And I can tell you one common thing that I find in a lot of those homes is those older guys were resourceful as heck. Baby food jars, your, any kind of glass jars, screw them to the bottom of the shelf, twist it and put it in there. They, this one's got this type of screw in it. That one's got that kind of nail in it and, and pencil sharpeners everywhere. And like, I've been in so many of those houses where there's this little mini workshop in the basement. Those guys reused everything. Nothing gets thrown away. Oh, that little scrap piece of wood. Okay, fine. I can either build something out of it or I can burn it in the fireplace. Or, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we got away from that where everything's disposable this, disposable that. You know, so if you stop and take a look at what's around you, what you can reuse, do you need really need to throw it away, or can you? Is it useful still, in right. some way, shape, or form? Well, and on that note, I have to tell you that there is a concept in Japanese philosophy, and it's called moitone, and that translates to not being wasteful of your resources. Be mindful about what is available within your landscape. But also, it's a very fine line between being mindful of the resources and being borderline cheap. Yes. It I'm glad is. you went there, yeah. Uh, absolutely. So I always make the clarification in there because there's nothing sexy about being cheap. I don't want somebody arguing about a dollar item or, you know, the drink at the restaurant. There's nothing sexy about that. It's okay to be frugal. It's not okay to be cheap. Well, now, a frugal you person will frugal. spend money on things that are necessary to spend good money on. Right. A cheap person will just spend the cheapest dollar amount on anything and everything in their life. Right. So by you being mindful about their resources, then you can you know, allocate extra time or money or spending funds for other things. But also it makes it sustainable and eco-friendly for the environment, which I'm very passionate about. Yeah. yeah, definitely a lot of crossovers and things to take away there. But I wanted to go back to what you said about kind of the macho attitude of military law enforcement and stuff. I think working with art no matter what type it is, can provide, and there's no perfect balance to this, but if you're in a high stress career, like military, law enforcement, paramedics, doctors, nurses, maybe even teachers, any one of those really super high stress, high, high performance type industries, you probably need more, a lot of balance. And that is a good way to bring maybe your life and stress levels a little bit more in balance. May not perfectly in balance, right? There's no that balance is different for everybody, what everybody needs. But I think that there's a lot of power in, in that being able to do something for people like that. Well, I'm gonna bring you another mic dropping moment. Because I'm the queen on that. When people avoid self care, they are mastering negligence to themselves. And that's something that nobody talks about. You have to put other first. You have to be responsible. You have to be the grown up, behave like an adult, uh, play your role, all these different things. And the more you brainwash yourself with that mentality, the more likely you're gonna get sick, you're gonna have mel uh, mental issues, you're gonna get depressed, you're gonna be cranky, because you are neglecting yourself from the basic right to do something that makes you happy and it makes you a better person. I so I, that. 
So I started this year campaigning for do not master negligence. And people are like, what? Yes, like you hear it. Do not master negligence. Because, for example, when you are in a toxic situation, and I'm a total senior on that one, I own it. I'm going to be very clear and sincere about it. The times that I wanted to keep peace in the Middle East, and I was the one absorbing the weight of things not being resolved, I was being negligent to myself. Because I was the one overloading my brain, thinking about what was not conducive for me, how the other person was taking advantage of me, how the situation was not favorable for me. And the world carries on spinning around the orbit. So I was being negligent to myself by not taking the uncomfortable conversation or taking the uncomfortable decision making. And that's something that majority of us get conditioned to take that route. So if I can make people think about it and ponder about it, I'm going to feel quite accomplished. So whatever you chose to do after this virtual time together if there's one single thing that i want you to take home and ponder about it's negligence are you being negligent to yourself i venture to say a lot of people if they're honest with themselves would say yes i know i've been there i did that a couple of years ago you know i was i was super stressed a lot of things going on and i had this awakening moment if you will of like i got all this stuff going on in my life and I'm trying to do things, you know, I mean, I've got these goals in life, right? I'm trying to do on my path, do th certain things, live my life by my design. But also at the same time, I was I was kind of doing the same thing, right? I was neglecting myself, wasn't taking care of myself in the way I wanted to. One of those things was what was I allowing negative to come into my life? What was what kind of things was I doing that weren't bringing me any joy? I won't say what it was, but there was something that I was involved in that was like, look, it no longer brought me any joy. It no longer served a purpose. I enjoyed it for a while, but every time I thought about it or had to do anything for it, it just annoyed the heck out of me. It would bring me so down. And I was like, I got to be done. 100% got to be done. Cut that out of my life. Get it out of here. Put it in the rear view mirror and don't let that influence my life anymore. That's just one thing. You know, <laughs> cutting that one thing made a huge impact. All that extra time I got back, the energy, the mental focus. I didn't have to get so angry and upset about things anymore, you know. And so, anyway, I think there's a there's a lot to that. But you definitely gave us a good, a, a darn good blueprint and some things to think about today. <laughs> Not be negligent you know? to yourself and control your environment and cut out those things. I mean, all kinds of different things. So, uh, but last thing I want to do here is I want to point out I've had it scrolling for a few minutes. Have no fear. If you are listening, it's in the show notes. Uh, etniafusion.com is your website. Tell us what, yes. the, what kind of things we can find there on your website. Yeah, so my website needs to be updated, but you can get a glance of the different things that I have been doing in the performing arts. I am transitioning to more on the approach of mental wellness and therapeutic art just because that's what lights me up and i think that i can do better service with my brilliance in that department for the community and the people out there because i see the results in my own life but anyways uh, we can connect there's a little bit of information about my bio what i do what i'm passionate about some of the highlights of uh things that i have done in the past few years with my company etnia fusion which originally started as a performing art company and then evolved into educational programs and then into the therapeutic arts and public engagements and public speaking. So kind of a fusion of everything you do. <laughs> yes, well, that's me. You know, I have a little bit of every continent on the planet except Antarctica and how I wish that I was related to the penguins, but I don't mm. have that. <laughs> you think about it long enough, you might come up with something. <laughs> right? Yes. So I'm very passionate, again, about intertwining things, different modalities, being inclusive, honoring cultural diversity, and 
sprinkle with a lot of neuroscience because it really makes a world of difference. So everything that I'm doing currently, it has a background in neuroscience. I might not talk about it. People might not be aware of it, but it's very intentional. So all my engagements, my projects, performances, it has a layer at least or two that they are related to neuroscience. So that's kind of the highlights of what I am right now, but I'm always delighted to connect with a few, you know, people that they might find interesting what I have to say if they want to give it a try themselves and see if it's a suitable match for their pursuits. And it's always good to be experimental. That's how you find new passions and new talents. Just go and try something just for the heck of it. Uh, there's a lot of things in this world that were created by many, many little accidents, right? <laughs> yes. Well, this didn't work. That didn't work. Oh, boom. Hey, we got something. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that's just how the world works. So, uh, I, once again, I appreciate you coming on here. Um, I hope everybody goes and, and likes and follows your social accounts and everything. Don't worry. I have all that in the show notes for, for, the, uh, for the viewers or the listeners. So, I really appreciate you coming on here and sharing with you. This is, like, like I said in the beginning, fascinating conversation. I think it's this is an area where everybody can go back and examine where where they're at right their environment zen what is influencing your decisions what's impacting your mood and everything every day and there's a lot of takeaways here but good good blueprint and this is something and this is something that is suitable for all ages and all genders which is beautiful this is no inclusive or exclusive for one niche or the other one it's very welcoming to everybody who wants to engage into that practice. And I campaign for it. I advocate for it because I am living proof of what is possible. I was sinking into depression 27 months ago. And this year I am part of four different books. One of them is already a uh, best international seller in Amazon. None of that, it will have been possible if I didn't ground it myself doing the contemplative arts, the therapeutic arts and the neuroscience. So if I was able to do that, I have all the faith in the world that other people can find their own holy grail and be, you know, happily ever after. Absolutely. I think, you know, last thought before we wrap this up, you know, for me, like you said, anybody can do it. So if you're listening to this and you're interested, check with your spouse, your partner, um, you know, dive into some of this stuff Try, work through it yourself work through it with your partner and maybe your kids even right share this it, it could be it could be kind of a family thing of like you know it is gratitude and working through things and how you talk to each other and how you're just present for everybody you know think about what that you know does could do for that next generation you know especially especially speaking to the parents out there who maybe have kids still at home like think about what kind of lasting impact that could be if you if you teach them some of these skills how to manage their stress and manage their environments and what kind of level of success that could bring for them and it can be tailored for that family orientation because as a matter of fact i did a program for a group of ladies in nevada and i had three generations taking my class the granddaughter the daughter and the two grandmas and it's something that you can go in so many different approaches and directions. You know, you can do it as a solo practice like I do, but it can be a generational activity like this group of ladies hire me to do a program for them. It can be something with a, a, a different twist where, you know, you want to spark a little bit more of, you know, romance and intimacy in your relationship with your significant other, your spouse and you can give each other flowers you know or you can change the floral arrangement one week i take care of that next week you take care of that and let's wall and surprise each other with flowers how beautiful is that just think about how much more me it'll mean to them when uh when you made it with heart and with love versus just going to the store and picking up a rose or does well, and, not only, <laughs> and not only that but it has your personality reflected on it because it's not just the flowering out the door. It's the enhancement, the adornment, the angles, 
like a, how do you accessorize certain things? What kind of containers do you pick for the occasion? That it's going to reflect your personality. So you are intertwining being mindful about somebody important in your environment, but also you have your own way of self-expression and creativity. Everything about it is so beautiful and so rich and so beneficial. So I hope that I can spark that passion into a few of the listeners out there. And I would love to hear comments and maybe a little note giving me some, some insights of how this conversation worked out for you and what was relevant. Absolutely. And if anybody out there, you know, tries to go create their own art because of inspire, uh, being inspired by this, put it, post it on social media and tag me in it. You know, tag both of us in there. You know, we want to, we want to see it. Like, you know, share it with the world. Share your create, you know, your creative geniuses with everybody else out there. So that's that's my uh, action item that I ask everybody to do. If you're taking action on this and you're creating something physically with your hands, some sort of artwork, um, you know, take a picture of it, post it out there, and, and maybe put a little narrative, be vulnerable a little bit, and say. I created this, and here's how I feel about, you know, open up, put put that good stuff out in the universe a little bit. Well, you know, on that note, I'm going to send you the link to my gallery of pictures so you can put it on the notes and people can review, like, all the different things that you can do with flowers, and they can make their own interpretation of some of those designs. Because that way you have a reference, you have something visual to go by it instead of just a conversation by itself. That's a good point. <laughs> that's, that's helpful, especially for those of us that like picture books and stuff like that. You know, I need an example to go off of. <laughs> oh, you but, see, I got you covered. I yeah, told you, you I was going to get that, you covered. That you do. That you do. So anyway. And you know what? I'm going to take it a step farther. I have like a four minute tutorial how to do a floating arrangement. I'm going to include that on the notes for you too. Awesome. That sounds like it's simple enough that even I can follow those instructions. <laughs> oh, you should. Okay. That's going to be your okay. action that's, that's item. That's my challenge. My action item. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go public. Go. I'm going to I'm gonna send you the gallery of pictures and the tutorial, and you're going to go public at your leisure, but no in 2023, before the end of the year, you're going to make your own arrangement, and you're going to put it social and public out there, and you're going to tag it. Okay. You got it. Okay, you got I'm going to I'm going to hold you responsible for the action taking. <laughs> I know you will. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I know how to get you. <laughs> yeah, that you do. Yeah, I'm not I'm not that hard to get a hold of. So, anyway, Nefertiti, I I really appreciate the conversation. This this is this is something else. I don't have much more to say about it other than that. A lot of a lot of <laughs> stuff that people can take away from it. And I hope people enjoy it and and run with it and you know, that's, this really fits in line with what this whole podcast is founded on, is just offering education or inspiration to the veteran and military spouse community to better their lives. You know, and, and sometimes it's very, very specific. Sometimes it's more general like this of just look what's in your environment and start fixing a little something and be consistent and all those different things we've talked about. So I really appreciate I call it edutainment. Edutainment. That's my special, yeah, edutainment. Because it's entertaining, but I also educate people into things that they are new to them. And it's a beautiful thing. I love it. That it is. So um, I'll, have to, I'll have to get watching watching your thing, and uh, we'll, we'll post it out there, and, and uh, we'll get it out there to the world. Everybody will see my creative geniuses. Yes, and then you cannot tell me anymore, oh, I am not artsy. I am not creative. <laughs> like, we are eradicating that viewing of yourself. Okay, all right. We'll, ch we'll change the narrative, so. Anyway. Yes, I'm on a mission for that, and I'm sending it to you via email as soon as we finish this recording. Much love, <laughs> right. appreciation. Thanks for the virtual time and the spotlight. I love you all, and I'm looking forward to making new connections. There you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, that was a while. I told you she was a ball of energy. Um, that was that was a great. There's so many bits of information that are valuable. Um, Speaking of value, my my website is battlebuddypodcast.net. As a reminder, I always try and uh, add resources there. So if something's not there you think should be, let me know. And the National Suicide Hotline number is 988-PRESS-1. So if you're struggling, remember, we want to see you tomorrow. We want you here tomorrow. So call that number. <laughs>